in Brennig, North Wales. September 1990. Ninety of the top anglers from around the world have gathered here to compete in the World Fly Fishing Championships. Number 21, Brian Ledbetter. That's almost, world e that's almost exactly the same number of pints that we had last night. <laughs> Today, one angler is going to come out on top. What is it that makes him so much more consistent than the rest of us fly fishermen? Each angler has his own reasons for the tactics he uses, based on an appreciation of the fish, its habitat, and the way in which it feeds. Top of the water techniques, or light line fishing, is a modern refinement of a very traditional approach, based on the imitation of food items and an understanding of the still water environment. But fishing is not a definitive art where there's a single best way of doing things. And this, of course, is a large part of the inexhaustible and challenging joy to be gained from fly fishing. Top anglers spend much of their time fishing for the relaxation offered by their surroundings and because they enjoy tuning into an aspect of the natural world. A more conscious acknowledgement of this enhances your day's sport and your success, as we will show. Being able to adopt this approach is really very simple, requiring an open mind to look at the conditions around you and the ability to change tactics as necessary. Chris Ogborn has been in the England fly fishing team for 10 years. For him, representing his country in his favorite sport was the ultimate goal. It all began for Chris in the West Country, on the shores of Chu and Blagden lakes, one of the finest schooling grounds that any angler could wish for. Blagden Lake started as a trout fishery in 1904, in the days of greenheart rods, salmon flies and gut casts. The equipment has changed considerably since then. To the space age technology of high modulus carbon fiber, fluorescent feathers and pre-stressed nylon. What hasn't changed is the fact that top anglers catch fish through their appreciation of the trout's behavior and the environmental conditions which affect it. In short, the key to success lies in your approach rather than in any single fly or rod. Chris Ogborn is going to show us some of the techniques he uses to stay on the top. Well, this is Cheddar Water, probably one of my favorite spots on all of Blagdon. Favourite for many reasons really, but not the least of which is that it's really got the view. It's got the whole panorama of Blagdon, the whole lake opening out in front of us. On a morning like this, it's so lovely. We've got swans in the water, duck in the air, loads of fly life, which we'll talk about in a minute. But for the moment, isn't it enough just to be here with the wildlife all around us? Beautiful place to be. Before we do any fishing, we've got to cover some basics of entomology. And I think it's about time we went and saw what there was in the air and on the ground around us. Give us some pointers for the day's fishing. The study of fly life isn't nearly as daunting as a lot of people would have you believe. It's relatively straightforward, but without it, we can't get to copying the flies at the tying bench, and we can't really deceive the fish, which is really what this is all about. And the study of fly life is just as relevant here at Blagdon as it is on Grafham or Rutland or Buell or any other still water in the land, large or small. The basic fly species are the same here and on all those other waters. And the one you've got to look at, but the one else, is the one we caught, which is a little midge. Now, the midges, otherwise known as buzzers, coronamids, means exactly the same thing. The midge life cycle is egg, to bloodworm, to pupa, to adult. But only part of that life cycle is viable to us. So, really, apart from bloodworm, which are less important, pupa and adults are really what it's all about. And those are fairly clear and fairly easy to imitate. What we've also got in here and in every other lake is sedge. And all you've got to do is to turn over a stone anywhere you go. And on the bottom of that stone, you're going to see caddis pupa. Again, it's important to realize what sort of environment they prefer. Midge like a nice, soft, silty bottom where they can burrow in. Caddis sedge prefer a rocky bottom where they can make these little cases. As well as those, you've also got snail here, which is an important food item, although less easy to imitate at the tying bench. You've got corixa, which prefer shallower water, and you've got that lovely little jerky ascent, descent motion that they do in about three or four feet of water. Daddy longlegs also, 
um, is around for about three months of the season and obviously it's a very sizable food item. Our hopper is the copy and although it might not look too much like it at the moment, um, the daddy, imagine it in the water, wet, the legs streaming back a bit bedraggled. In actual fact, the hopper is a very close copy. It's worth spending a few minutes at the start of your day observing these key pointers to give you a basis for your initial fly selection. Remember, the fish will probably be feeding on the insects you can see. Well, that was outline entomology. The painful part for some people, but really it's just a logical process of trying to match the hatch, trying to match what you're tying on to what's happening on the water. And what we've got there today is a fairly breezy day, changeable, but lots of Daddy Longo has been blown onto the water by the wind, so it's a fairly logical sequence. We're using the hopper, which is a dry, fairly close copy of the Daddy Long Legs. We're going to fish it on the top of the water, so we need the old gink to keep things floating, as they should be. And if you like, we're as far as we can matching the hatch today, so let's go and catch some fish. I see I'm boring again, just for a change. Well, you know what they say, age before beauty. Uh, I know what you've always said. It's the only tangible benefit of a very expensive education. <laughs> that ripples eased off nicely, Dad. Just a touch. A bit easier than it was. Fish moved about 11.30, yeah, 15 it. yards in front of me. So I'm just on the edge of that wind lane. Right. Yeah. This is really perfect for Bristol style dry fly, isn't it, today? We're using two hoppers, one size 10 on the point, which is a fairly close copy, um, and size 14 as the dropper, both hoppers. It covers a whole range of patterns, really. Although the hopper is initially designed to represent the daddy long legs, it, certainly in the smaller sizes, it's a very good general suggestive pattern for sedge and even hatching midge. Uh, the essence really, I suppose, of the hopper is that it's, it's a bit like the, the pheasant tail. As the pheasant tail is a general suggestive nymph pattern, so too is the hopper a, a general suggestive dry fly. Again, the, hop, the, the hopper is viable though because, of course, all the daddy long legs is usually associated with September fishing, late season. It is, in fact, on the water sometimes as early as May, but uh, certainly you've got a good three months worth of viable daddy long legs fishing. Trying to put that hopper down in that wind lane there. Mm -hmm. A few snapping casts just to draw off the hopper. No need to keep re-ginking, no, no need to keep retreating the flies. Just a couple of casts like that in the air to clear the water out of the flies. Should be enough to keep them on or in the surface. And presentation being the all-important thing, the trick is to stop the line just at the very end of the cast. So, send a cast, it's shooting out, stop there, like that. At the end of the cast, just before the very end of the cast, trap the line with the left hand, straightens everything out, and the flies land. One, two, three in sequence. If you don't stop the line like that, what happens is that you tend to end up with the leader landing in a bit of a bunch. Flies landing in any old sequence, sometimes on top of each other. Just there, that one point of stopping. There's a slight exaggeration, but that's how it's done. Let's go extra off and cover that fish that just rose there. One of those things that becomes second nature after a while do it automatically and you do it subtly so it's just a question of stopping the line there. Copper fishing dad really is all, what it's all about isn't it? The, you're you're, you're copying a food item as close as you possibly can, presenting it in a reasonably lifelike way and that really is what genuine fly fishing should be all about. You're absolutely right Chris. You can provoke aggression, you can provoke reactions from the fish but the reaction that we're really trying to get to is making him believe it's food. And the hopper really typifies that. It sits in a natural way, it sits in the surface in a lifelike manner. It looks just like the real thing. Oh, Chris, this is squally today. It's nasty, isn't it?
Look at the speed yeah. of this drift. We are, it's actually, it's almost too fast for good dry flight fishing, but look at that, you took that straight off the surface. First cast, absolutely first cast. I was just about to say, I thought we were going to be in a slight problem with fishing hoppers in this, but my goodness. I don't know if you like that, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Good literally as it landed on the water. Whew. That is pulling. Get some line back in have some degree of control and then play them on the line. I was just about to say to you, I thought we were almost getting to the stage where there was too much wind for decent hopper fishing, dry fly fishing, but that's proof wrong straight away. That's interesting, Daddy. Took the smaller hopper. Took the 14, not the 12, which is actually not really that close to the, the sort of size of the, the adult daddies that are on the water. Come here. Oh, lovely fish. Lovely. It's a nice clean, nice clean hen fish. Oops, come on up. You can go back. And it's proof positive. Hopper nicely through the scissors. One hopper, one hen fish, going back to spawn. Yeah. That was interesting. We're getting odd shower coming through with this squalls as well. Yes, I think we might get a a little damp in a moment. Because the ripple's actually rolling over and in some cases it's draining the fly, but with the hopper that's not always a bad thing. You can get a really decent hopper right down in the surface with the legs trailing well behind. It looks just as attractive, certainly in a big wave, when you'd expect the adult insect to be half drowned anyway. Um, so although you might think it's bad presentation, the fish seem to think it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that one's certainly enjoying it. Yeah, you, did. you can actually give a bit of movement too, we've discovered that this year. I think yeah. the, the old dry fly school has been going there for a couple of years down here, but most people's idea is that you have three static flies on the surface. In actual fact, you can give life to a hopper by giving it a bit of movement. No harm at all. We found sometimes even quite a fast retrieve on a hopper actually pulls the fish. I suppose it's the old trading legs and the tumbling wave tops. But that one took it absolutely almost the moment it hit the water. Beautiful. I'll try and follow these wind lanes too if we can, because no doubt wind lanes are always good for any sort of fishing, but particularly on dry fly, where you're presenting it to a, a very clear field of vision for the track. Ruffled water means they can't see so well. Um, the relatively calm water in the wind lane means they can clearly see your offering. Got a sitting up there, an absolute treat now. You, just, you can just see the head, but it means the back of the fly is trailing down, just as it should be. There you are, Dad, look at that over there, buzzard. Isn't that See? beautiful? Really being, beautiful. Being harried by a couple of crows, yeah. but he's, he's soared away <laughs> now. Beautiful bird. Can you see its mate? Nope, only the one at the moment. Are you pulling your hoppers, Dad? You're giving it some movement, aren't you? Yes, and keep in mind, well, the yeah. boat's moving They're moving so fast, fast yeah. It's so often in dry flight, it looks as though you're retrieving. In actual fact, you're not. You're just keeping up with the flies. As the boat drifts down, you've got to keep reasonable contact between you and the flies so that when you strike, you're in contact straight away. So with this scuddy wind, it just keeps that chill on the surface and that's never going to... Never what you want for dry fly, successful dry fly fishing anyway. You want the ripple, the ripple, but you don't really want it to be a scuddy ripple like that, which just chills that surface layer. That's right. Come on, Father, get your flies out the wrong side of the boat. <laughs> you really would think that you're bound to see a fish in that wind lane, wouldn't you? What, what rod are you using today, Chris? Uh, on the, oh, all right, don't answer now. I will answer, Dad, I promise you. 
Roll off the tire. It's lovely. Took the hopper as sweet as anything off of there. The, the, the short answer is nine foot six because that's my favourite length. Um, and some of the big wins that we've been having, we certainly were having earlier on, um, some people would advocate 10, 10 and a half foot maybe, but for my money, there's not very much that you can do. Ooh. Not very much that you can't do with a nine and a half foot that you can do with a longer rod. So it's kind of a rod for all seasons. You can ooh, you put a fair amount of pressure as I'm doing now, and you've still got control over the fish. Um, so with a longer rod, they tend to be a bit less sensitive. Um, certainly the sort of the, the ten and a half foot sort of rated for six weight lines are generally much more like a seven or an eight weight line. And of course you don't get the same subtlety of presentation with a heavier line, so I reckon that the nine and a half foot is a good compromise size for just about everything. I even use this rod on the rivers, you know, to, you? Yeah, I use this use this same rod that I've got in my hand now. Lovely, look at that curve on there now. Beautiful, Ben. I used this same rod in the uh, World Championship up on the River D, and it was more than comfy with that. Come on there, Mr. Fish. Oops. Another beautiful hen fish. Yep. Oh, that was nice. Amazing, actually. I mean, these are beautifully conditioned fish. Yeah, he took the hopper right through the top lip, Dad. Wouldn't, wouldn't have got off in a million years. Look at that. Beautiful fins. Absolutely like square tailed. This is, this is the success point, but where it really begins is at home at the fly tying bench where that little hopper was born. We leave Chris thinking about the gentle art of catch and release and turn to the evolutionary process of fly tying. As new patterns are evolved, so too are new methods of fishing them. Because of this, fly tying is at the heart of the sport. A pleasurable and creative alternative to winter evenings in front of the television. Except for watching fishing videos, of course. Chris has been a tire almost longer than he's been a fisherman, and clearly remembers helping his father at the tying bench even before he ventured out on the water. He'd be the first to admit that he doesn't tie flies to win prizes. Rather, they are flies that catch fish. Patterns that have evolved through his experience of rivers and lakes in many different corners of the world. Well, before we start fly tying proper, we've got to look at the most important single basic, which is the humble hook. And hook technology has come an awful long way in the last five years. There was a time when all hooks were handmade, and it was a fairly basic, barbaric process. Now we have a thing called chemical sharpening, which is really giving us much finer quality hooks. The process originated in Japan, but it's now being employed in England as well. Basically, you get very, very finely cut points with an acid etching process, and it also enables you to cut much cleaner, finer barbs for better penetration and better hook hold. Um, hooks, in fact, are probably the most single important factor in terms of actually catching a fish. Um, if you've got a, a good quality hook, it won't straighten out at the wrong moment and won't let you down, then obviously it's worth paying a little more for them. And I have to say that chemical sharpened hooks are expensive, but they are superb and you should do that. It's not an expensive investment in your sport. Also important is the hook wire gauge. Um, again, there was a time not so many years ago when people would pick up the first hook they found in their fly tying kit, tie a fly on it, without any thought as to how heavy the hook was, whether it was suitable for a floating fly, sinking fly. So this hook is nice and fine wire for some of the dry fly patterns. This hook is a heavier gauge wire for some of the deeper nymphs. In actual fact, it would be the same thing really as using this hook with about four or five inches of lead wire attached to it. To we'll kick off with, we're going to go straight into the hopper. The hopper is one of those general patterns that's supposed to officially represent the daddy long legs, but in actual fact, it represents a whole host of patterns, a whole different styles of insects, different stages in their life cycle. Um, it's a fly that's open to an awful lot of variation, but the basic pattern that we're going to have a go at now is probably still my favourite. It's the simple amber hopper. We kick off having laid a good bed of tying silk with some blended amber seal spur. There are variations on the market, there are substitutes on the market, but there's still no substitute for the real thing. It's getting increasingly hard to find, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, there just is no substitute, so I've laid in an awful lot of stock. Relatively slim body, relatively sparse seal spur application. Um, a lot of people put too much seal spur in their flies. Um, you don't really need it, it just needs a nice, even, slim body all the way through. 
then come to the legs, which is the fun part of the process. These actually are made from knotted pheasant tail fibres. You can do it yourself, and the cheating way of doing it, which I must admit I do, is to get the kids to do them. And the going rate, if anybody's interested, is 10p a dozen. But you have to be very careful on quality control, because where you put the knots on these legs is important. It should be between a quarter and a third of an inch of the end. Three legs on either side. A popular misconception is that need to splay out at the sides. Not true. That makes the fly sit much too high on the surface. If you have the legs pointing down, then the actual fly sits well down in the surface film rather than on the surface film. And finally, we finish off with a nice medium game hackle. Pair the hackle by taking the flue off, tie in just behind the head. Maybe three turns at the most are all that's needed. Again, it's very, very easy to over-hackle a fly. You don't want the thing sitting up really, really proud on the water surface. You need it sitting down in, and any more than three turns of hackle is overkill. Here comes the lazy Chris Ogborn bit. I finish my flies still with the old half hitch. Um, everybody tells me I'm wrong. Everybody tells me I should use the whip finish. I can do it, I promise you, but I haven't yet found any fish that can tell the difference. It's still a neat head. A touch of varnish. Completes the hopper. The use of a rib is optional on the hopper and indeed on many dry fly patterns. This one, as you can see, the rib really lashes down the seal sphere, gives you a tighter body, whereas the conventional pattern without the rib gives you more spike, more life in the seal sphere. This fly will float slightly better, but in some instances, this fly will be a closer copy. They are, aren't they? We've got a nice team of flies on, Dad, now. Dries. Still got the size 10 hopper on, that lovely amber hopper, but um, yeah. we've got an emerger in the middle and a uh, very small shipman style buzzer on the top, so three nice drives landing in sequence. Well, it, it's so windy, I only had two flies on there. A pheasant tail nymph and a, a little emerger, but frankly it's doing me no good at all. The conditions have changed, haven't they? Haven't they? Haven't they just? Basically, I think we're, we're suffering from too much sunshine. We've got, it's gone very bright. We've still got this nasty scuddy wind and the, the chill factor on the water is definitely pulling the fish down a bit. I've got an idea we might be better off, you know, moving to the bank and trying, trying some slow buzzer tactics from the bank. I think you're absolutely right, Chris. Change the depth a bit. What do you think? That's, I, wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind stretching my legs anyway and uh, have, have, a, move, have a walk along that attractive bank, yeah? Yeah, come on, let's make right. a move. Fine. Right. Well, this looks fairly likely. Got a very deep water bank here. Straight into about, straight into about four or five feet. Um, there look to be one or two fish showing down this side as well, so. See if we can tempt one to the buzzer. One of the worries that a lot of people have on buzzer fishing is that they're moving their fly too fast, particularly late in the evening when the, the pupa are just simply coming up to the surface to hatch. But really, as long as the movement's reasonably lifelike, you're, all you're doing is exaggerating it. It's the same principle as exaggerating a feature in a fly on a, an imitative pattern or a, a representative pattern. Um, the pheasant tail actually doesn't look like anything, but it suggests a lot of things. Well, what we're doing is moving a fly in a way that suggests it's a buzzer pupa, even if it isn't exactly copying the movement of the actual pupa itself. Fish out there moving, but he's well out of range at the moment. As the day wears on, 
the fish become more and more dour, showing no signs of feeding, and it looks as though the evening rise is going to let us down. With light fading, a faint drizzle falls on what is now a very calm evening. But, as is often the case, the last cast of the day falls in view of a solitary rising brownie. I think that was the fish we saw alive. Oh, a little brownie too. Super little brownie. Exhausted himself with four mad leaps. Come on, little chap. You can go back. Lovely little end of season brownie. Beautiful little fish. Just under a pan. Fishing circumstances like that require a very high visibility buzzer pattern, and that's what we're going to try now. So I've laid the basics, and we're going to rib this one with some fine gold wire. It's really only an optional extra of the gold wire, but buzzer patterns, because they're very small, tend to be a bit susceptible to the trout's teeth. So the rib really just helps keep the whole thing together and it means that it's not a one fish fly. You can catch three or four before it gets torn to pieces. The colour of the seal sphere is a blend. It's a mix of hot orange and amber, which gives a very nice blend. Again, very sparse, no real bulk to it, just a nice, slim, compact, fairly consistent body. We we'll take that roughly two thirds of the way up the shank, then use the gold rib, binding in fairly close turns, four or five turns. This is a size 14 hook, so four or five turns is ample. Seal spoon itself, and to a certain extent, the Antron substitute, which is more freely available these days, is actually a naturally translucent material, and the use of a wire as a rib gives you a very nice overall effect to the fly. Now, the high visibility element comes in with a very short length of DRF, which is fluorescent, bright fluorescent red wool. Just a couple of turns more than enough. Take that around and tie it off. That forms in effect a little collar just behind the head. Very, very bright, intense ball of colour and that acts in certainly in some water conditions, particularly murky water conditions, as a sighter for the fish. And the final completion for this buzzer, which is a relatively simple pattern, is one single strand of peacock curl, which forms the head. Five, six, maybe seven turns. Peacock curl can vary in its, in its quality and density. Tie that one off. Take the silk through the peacock curl just two or three times, again for security and for long life of the fly. A couple of turns, either whip finish or half hitch. And that's the high visibility buzzer pattern. Nice and simple. There we are to make perhaps is to elaborate on the seal sphere mixing. Um, what I'm using is a blend of hot orange and amber seal sphere. It's about a 50-50 blend. You get a far better spectrum of colours when you use blended seal sphere, not just for this pattern but for all other patterns involving seal sphere. I always blend. Very, very rarely would I use just one single colour on its own. Um, you can risk divorce by using the food blender to mix the seal sphere, but if you take the cautious attitude, which I do, you do it all by hand. And it's just a pull, push, tease it all together, rub it in your hand into a little ball, pull it out again. Maybe use the scissors if you've got some fairly long fibres. That helps in the mixing process. Basically, just so that you get the two covers, colours nice and evenly blended, and then use it as a dubbing in the usual way. Well, that's just one buzzer pattern. Quite obviously, there are very, very many variations because one of the essences of buzzer fishing is that you have to match the hatch. Um, there are so many different midges, there are so many different colours of midges that really the variations are endless. But one of my favourites at the moment, and one of the best uses of colour, certainly in the high visibility buzzer pattern, is this new material, or relatively new material, from Tom Seville called buzzer tubing. What it is is a very, very fine, 
very thin polythene tubing. Um, although it's only half a millimetre thick, it's actually hollow. And what you do is choose your body colour. In this case, we'll stick with the hot orange. Take a small length of tying silk. And hopefully, if you can see straight, run it down inside the tubing. That's the difficult bit. There we go. cut off the surface. Now that very simply, no ribbing, that very simply is tied in just on the bend. Obviously all the best buzzer patterns start from just around the bend. Bring the tying silk back up to the two-thirds position and then tie in the buzzer tubing at the tail. That gives you the most super mixture of a very very lifelike, almost like a segmented body pattern. It also gives you buoyancy because of the tubing itself and the air trapped inside. And thirdly, it gives you the colour because the colour of the, the body is really taken up by the thread inside the tubing. Now after that, you simply tie in the body in the usual way, depending on the colour you're looking for. What I prefer to do on this one is to put a little collar of peacock curl. This is in place of the fluorescent wool. small collar of peacock curl, in front of which goes just a small pinch of the seals for a blend that we've just used. Three, maybe four tones, depending on the density of colour. Either whip finish or half hitch. And that is one of the best buzzer variations that we've got at the moment. There we go. Completed variation. And that fly, especially in size 14, really points up the usefulness of the silhouette disc. You're tying small flies with a nice clean white background that excludes all the other background clutter. You put a nice clear vision on the fly only. Really, really makes a difference on fly tying. It saves on the eyesight. If you want to get an even better density of colour on this method, then you simply use two lengths of tying silk down through the buzzer tubing rather than one. And the actual end result, you'll still get the same sheen, but you'll get an actual, the, the depth of colour will be greater. One of the first jobs when you arrive at any lake um, is to head for the lodge. And if you're new to the lake, try and find either a bailiff, who's bound to be the guy with all the local information, or better still, have a look in the lodge and see if there's a contour map of the lake. That'll show you where the submerged ditches are, old riverbeds, hedgerows, what used to be a forest perhaps, where there's going to be tree stumps. Any pointers that'll give you some indication on where you're likely to find some fish. It's a little bit daunting to see something like 1,200 acres of relatively featureless water and not really know where to start. But if by process of elimination you can find yourself some shelter from the prevailing wind, some useful contour where you've got a fair idea of the depth you're going to be fishing, um, that'll give you some idea of where to start, rather than just heading out blind into the vast open spaces. See if you can do a little bit of detective work before you actually get on the water. So this is Tuvalu Lake, late in the season. We're taking a very shallow water drift um, down off of Morton Bank, right the way through, almost over as far as Wick Green. It's very shallow water drift, probably no more than six, seven feet at the very most. Um, this time of the year, most of the brown trout are finding their way up into shallower water. The feeder stream, or in fact the, the header stream, comes in just over there to our right. We've got nice big features, you've got a submerged row of old tree stumps. One of them you can see sticking out of the water over there on the right. Basically a nice shallow water drift, pulling flies, a good team of flies for this time of year. Pheasant tail with a silver thorax, a straightforward Viva style mini mini attractor um, and a soldier palmer just when we're dribbling up through the surface. So shallow water fishing, nice open drift, classic Chew Valley lock style, we hope. It's worth remembering when fishing from the bank that areas of easy access are likely to get heavily fished. Places where casting is difficult or access is tricky are likely to hold more fish, fish that will be less easily spooked. 
got a bit of a change day today. We had a, overnight we've had a complete change round of the wind, um, which is never the greatest of conditions. It's exactly the same, funnily enough, that we had at Lynn Brennig in the World Championship, where there was a complete 180 degree reversal of wind overnight. Um, the day before we'd seen lots of fish on the surface and we thought that dry fly was going to be the order of the day. In fact, with complete changing conditions, put the fish down two or three feet, and intermediate was the line that won the day. So the weather, as ever, is making a very, very big effect on our fishing. Using fairly straightforward pulling tactics at the moment. Pulling, as its name implies, is just a very simple cast and retrieve, covering all the angles on the water fits in very nicely with our light line philosophy. I'm using a, a standard through leader of four pound double strength. Light line fishing is, in many people's ideas, just about the leader itself, but it's not. Light line really is a philosophy which affects the whole of your tackle. You have a, a light rod, nine foot six, rated for a five six weight line. In fact, this is a five weight line. Um, the whole thing balances up. If you try and use light line with a very stiff rod, poker action, you're gonna get broken every time. If you're going to use light leaders, and if you do so, you'll catch more fish without any question at all, and you've got to make sure that your outfit is balanced for a light line tackle. items of equipment is the old Mariscoop Priest. It does lots of things for you. Oh, which is going to do some very nice things for us here. It reveals what the fish has been taking. It either tells you what a clever chap you've been in copying what he's taken, or tells you how lucky you've been in catching something anyway. And he was feeding on something totally different, but this is proof positive. Got a beautiful midge pupa there. In fact, it's still wriggling. You can see it's still moving. You can also see the size of it, and we've got a good half an inch long there. And the pheasant tail nymph we're using is a general suggestive pattern. In other words, we've designed it to look like various midge pupa, although it doesn't actually directly copy it. Um, the size also is about right. Um, half an inch long, the fly is half an inch long. Um, so we'll, by presenting the trout with a general suggestive pattern, he's been feeding on these midge pupa as they come up from the bottom of the lake. They're being bowled along by the big wave that we've got today. And the movement that we're giving the pheasant tail means that we're giving a fairly reasonable suggestion if not representation of the food item. Water clarity, actual water quality if you like, is a fairly significant feature on any still water venue. Here in fact today, the back end of the season at Chew is a bit murky, but normally the water quality here is very good. But the actual colour uh, in the water is quite often caused by green algae, and reservoirs have this to either a greater or lesser extent. Um, in the Midlands, for instance, you've got Rutland, where the place is famous for its absolute gin clear water. And just a few miles down the road, you've got Grafham, which has nearly always got a, a green algae tinge. The flies that you choose are actually affected by that, because in murky water, a brighter fly obviously is going to stand out much more clearly. Um, whereas in very, very clear water, an ultra-bright fly can have the opposite effect. It can actually scare fish away. So it's a fact you've got to think about in your fly selection and when you're tying and when you're choosing the particular venue you're going to fish. The old adage about bright day, bright fly, dark day, dark fly, it's got some merit to it. Um, 
but more important really is the water quality. If you've got a very, very murky water, then you can be fairly liberal with colour in your fly. If you've got a very clear lake, then you have to think much more seriously about the sombre colours and perhaps a more imitative approach. Chris, this dry fly method of fishing, particularly on a large lake and particularly on a windy day such as today, uh, intrigues me. I've got to confess that I'm quite happy sometimes to come out in the boat, watch her, learn, and then come out in the boat another day without you and try and put it into practice. But I suppose it's age. Can't quite catch up with you all the time. Well, you're enjoying the dry fly, aren't you? Oh, you're I'm enjoying really... my dry fly fairly. Yeah, you only tried it the last couple of years, but it's, it's such a relaxing. I don't I'm too old to master it either, and believe me, I'm going to try. It's certainly, a, in, in my view, a superb way of lake fishing. It's probably the loveliest thing about still water dry is it's, it's relatively easy to get the basics under your hat. Are you making the suggestion that I need to conserve my energy well, at long last? With your advancing years, Dad, you've got to lose all the uh, angles, haven't you? I see. It's going to be one of those days. One of those days. <laughs> Yeah, the wind, that's the wind, sorry, it's the wind, it's pushed out quite a wave actually, but uh, it's worth making a point about noise in the boat though, because there was a certain gentleman who should remain nameless, I used to know, would tap his pipe out right on the side of the board, perfect flat calm, and you see all the fish within about 50 yards say, yes, we know, that's a boat, other way chaps, so yeah, make yourself inconspicuous in a boat, don't stand up and pretend to be a windmill, just sitting down is most comfortable anyway, it's the safest, and make as little noise as you possibly can in the boat fish are very very sensitive they don't have ears but they've got a very sensitive lateral line and they feel vibration they feel noise as vibration so the quieter you are on the boat the better let's have a look and see what water depth we've got yeah it's around about four foot which is what we expected it's a somewhat brutal method of doing the depth sounding but it's uh, at least it's fairly quick and fairly easy to do. You might of course feel that your 250 pound rod is uh, not suitable for the purpose, in which case use the landing net. I think we'd better go off going back in the shallower water down in the calmer stuff. <laughs> Can I just retract that last statement please? <laughs> I think we'll stay where we are. That took almost the moment the fly hit the water. Another nice rainbow. He's taking the pulling fly down, taking the, uh, the beaver. Mindedness on the water, the ability to observe and examine what's going on around you. At the fly tank bench, it's rather more of an inventive mind that's sometimes needed. And what we're going to look at now is pheasant tail, and that's probably one of the most copied, varied, and elaborated flies that you'll ever come across. Um, if you ask 10 people for their interpretation of a pheasant tail nymph, they'd probably give you 10 completely different answers. Um, we've actually experimented over the last few years in the Bristol School with all sorts of different themes and Apart from using different colour pheasant tail fibres themselves, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, you can also actually vary the fly and the whole character of the fly and the way it fishes by using a different depth. For the tail, we'll start off with the, the straightforward parts of it. I'm using a, a rather large feather from the back end of a badger cape. And you've got a nice white tip to the feather with a dark, almost black base. That goes in for the tail. 
proportion is important on the pheasant tail. Just extend nicely beyond the bend, about a third of the length of the fly out. And trim off. We'll then use fine silver wire for the rib. Um, just as in the buzzers, the silver rib is really more for durability on the fly than anything else, although it does actually add in some circumstances. And I'm going to use a very, very dark center tail feather from the melanistic pheasant, which has got a lot of grey about it. Um, the usual, the more usual pheasant tail feathers have got rather more brown, sometimes even light brown honey to them. Around about seven or eight fibres of pheasant tail, just over halfway up the shank. Tie them off, but leave them there because we're going to use them for the thorax case afterwards. Then around about three or four turns with the silver wire. More to lock off. That's effectively the basic fly. This is where the variations come in. Um, because at the thorax, and for a thorax, you can use all sorts of materials. In fact, the, the limit is only really your own imagination. You can use seal sphere in all the variations of colour, you can use pearly tinsel, and you can use silver or metal tinsels, um, depending really on how you want the fly to perform and what you're intending to represent. One of the best loose representations um, of the pheasant tail, certainly the longer shank pheasant tail like this one, is probably as a, a fairly good copy for the very small pin fry that you get from around about the end of May onwards on most still waters. Um, these are the fry of various coarse fish, either roach or dace or whatever. Um, they're around about half an inch long. And the silver thorax pheasant tail, especially when you link it up with the silver rib, is a very, very good copy. In fact, not far off a very close copy for those small fish. So it's basically fairly broad silver tinsel, wound in as a thorax, and tied off. And then again we come back to the badger feather. Take a few, just a small pinch, a few fibres, which goes in as a beard hackle, tied in nice and swept back because we want the fly to be a fairly streamlined affair. Some beard hackles you want them to protrude well downwards, on this one you want it to be sweeping nicely back. Trim those, pull the stubs, the pheasant tails fibre forward, off with a nice neat head. Just to prove all those doubting Thomases who always say that I can never tie a whip finish, I'll just prove that it can be done. And you have one of my favourite pheasant tail patterns for 1990. These are just four variations on possible hundreds that we could have. Um, the top one here is using black pheasant tail fibres with a peacock curl thorax. Um, coming down when we've got the very light badger hackle with a silver thorax and light pheasant tail fibres. Here we're using hot orange seals fur as, as a thorax with a nice honey hackle. And finally the modern material, pearly tinsel, which gives you a lovely mother of pearl effect on the thorax. And again, this is just inventiveness at the fly tying bench. Four variations on a theme, with many hundreds of possibilities, probably still to be invented. Well, another day, another fishery. This is Steeple Langford. I'm going to use the two-fly cast on the intermediate line. Um, the rig-up effectively is the same for any system, though. Um, fly line into a 30-inch braided butt section, 20 inches of 7-pound conventional strength monofilament, onto which your normal day-to-day -day leaders are tied. My day-to-day -day leaders are all done on double-strength, super-strength nylon. It's the pre-stretch variety, originates in Japan, really has revolutionized fishing over the last few years. Effectively you're fishing a leader of double the normal strength for the same diameter, so hence the name double strength. It's got one drawback though, and that's that it's very shiny. So first job before you do anything else is to remove the shine. That's done with either a proprietary or your own make of Fuller's Earth Mix. It's a Fuller's Earth glycerin based. It's very abrasive and what it does is what is actually removing the shine from the leader, which you do it like this, running it between your fingers. It also helps it penetrate the water's surface when the leader lands, so you get a nice clean surface penetration. The thing about double strength is you've got to take all that shine off. With conventional nylon you could just pull the line through your fingers a couple of times and that would be enough. 
the double strength you've got to pay much closer attention to it as well as pulling it through four or five times pinch it and roll it between your fingers at the same time removes all the shine gives you a nice leader the other most important aspect of double strength nylon is the knots that you use um, people are under the mistaken belief that you can just simply treat it in the same way as you do conventional nylon not true blood knots for instance will not work with double strength nylon so the one to use, the one that I use, are either the four-turn, three-turn water knot or a grinner knot, double grinner knot. Either are very, very good. They give you total knot strength and you can have complete confidence with the end result. I tie mine slightly more slowly than most people do, but I do it in two sections. Um, it's actually a foolproof method that when you've actually tied the knot, the two sections, if you like, of the knot slip together. And as they do it nice and cleanly, like that, then you know the knot sound. But vitally important to revise your ideas about knots for double strength. Leader construction and formats are probably one of the most important single aspects of fly fishing. Um, they're actually most neglected aspects as well because although leader material is relatively inexpensive in the overall scheme of our fishing tackle, they are after all the last link between you and the fish and so it's got to be done right. Um, the lengths are important, so for a conventional stillwater leader you'd be looking for about 30 to 36 inches on the top section to your first dropper about 40 inches between the two interim droppers and about seven foot to the tail. That makes for a nice balanced leader, gives you good clean turnover, nice presentation. If you do the old fashioned way, which is the, if you like, the Scottish way, although no disrespect is intended there, they would simply do three flies, 30 inch intervals and forget about it. That gives you a very, very nasty, unclean presentation. You quite often get three flies landing on top of each other and it's not what it's all about. Proportion is the important thing. So for this afternoon's two fly casts, it's about 40 inches between the permanent butt and the dropper and about six to seven foot for the tail fly. There's a slight variation for the dry fly leader rigs, um, although the lengths remain the same on the overall leader. The droppers on conventional pulling fly tactics would be around five to six inches. For dry flies, I like them longer, nearer nine inches. Um, and there again is an exception to that rule in that for the hedged bet, which is a dry fly on the point and a small suspended nymph in between, that one goes shorter. So the small suspended nymph is about two to three inches. To revise your ideas about knots for double strength. And finally the fly. Two fly casts, as I said. One will be a little stick fly variation and the other will be a little pheasant tail. There we go, click things down, and away we go. patterns was done down here at Steeple Langford for a whole variety of reasons, um, not the least of which is the water quality. The, the lake is spring fed so you've always got this near gin clarity, it's, it's very very nice clean water, um, but it also means that the fish can see very clearly and if you can con them in this sort of conditions then you can fool them anywhere. Um, but the lake itself is absolutely glorious, it's in the Wiley Valley in the Wiltshire, middle of the Wiltshire chalk area, um, it's got a nature reserve at one end so there's loads of wildlife around, lovely clean water, very nice quality fish and all in all a perfect place to uh, come and do our experimentation. Among the signs to look for on the water um, are the birds. A lot of grebes showing over here, and in late summer the grebes tend to shoal up and chase the fish fry. And just as you'd look on the seaside, you'd look for the mackerel shoals by locating the gulls, so too out here can you find the fish by locating the grebes. The grebes ran the fry up, and where the 
birds are fishing, so too will be the trout. Oh, missed that one. Right on the lift. Just on the lift up, just took it down in the uh, last few feet of the retrieve. Loads of kestrels in this valley. Yes, and we're in. Mm. Usual thing with me, just as I turn away to look at a bird or something going over. Very nicely. Really came and snatched at it. He's not, unfortunately, not fighting very well at all. Back for the net. It's funny, this is the autumn fish. Sometimes you get the really prime condition fish that fight like mad and really give you a run for your money. Um, this one's pulling, but he's not really pulling well. He's a little bit lethargic, so probably not going to take too long to bring him to net. Unless he makes one of those nasty final surges. Yes. That's a lovely fish. Uh, good fat, thick fish, about two and a half pound. Attractor flies. And by attractive flies, I don't necessarily mean every man's idea of a lure, which is something long and multiple feathered and really rather gaudy. My attractive flies, pullers as we call them, are really tied to international rules, which means that the overall fly length is no more than one inch long. So we have to be fairly economical with the use of all the materials. And what I'm going to do is to use marabou in two different ways. Marabou is one of the finest materials that ever came the fly tires away. It's got this wonderful mobility, moves in the air, moves in the water. Um, and it adds life because of that mobility. But one of the flies that we've been working on this last year is a variation on the Ever Faithful Viva, probably one of the most successful stillwater patterns of all time. But with this one, as you can see, I've only tied the silk less than halfway down the hook shank. And we're going to take a pinch of black marabou onto a relatively heavyweight hook shank. There's actually a traditional wet, which is one of the heaviest weights there is. a relatively slim bunch of black marabou. It's a half tail, i.e. halfway down the shank. And we're going to use marabou again, but in a different way. We're going to use it as a head. Again, you've still got that depth of colour, you've still got the mobility and the actual feather fibres themselves. But not many people would think of using marabou as a head or even as a body material. So it's going to give us a very, very intense lime green head. Three turns with about half a dozen strands of the green marabou. Cut off. And finish. The job actually is not quite done because as you can see these strands are way, way too long. So what you do is close your fingers over the hook shank so pinch out the trailing strands of marabou, which in actual fact are a bit stringy anyway, and you're left, if you pinch it right, the fly that's just on the inch long, trim off that one wayward strand of green, and you've got one of the most effective fly patterns of 1990. That fly, perhaps more than any other we've looked at, really exemplifies that there is nothing complicated whatsoever in fly tying. Some of the simplest flies are in fact some of the most effective and as far as beginners are concerned don't be the least bit put off if your fly doesn't look like the perfect copy you see in the book or it's a perfect magazine photograph that you've seen. As long as those flies work for you on your water then you'll have the same sense of achievement that even the biggest and the best experts will have. In fact this is two flies rather than one because 
exactly the same principle, works very well, but with white marabou instead of black. Slightly more visible on the green side of the disc. Here we go. Oh, I think this is quite a good fish. It certainly took much faster and much harder than the last ones. Oh, he's really going well. That's better, it's more like it. Really going well, my goodness. Whew. I think we've got quite a big fish here. It certainly looks that way. To go in the rushes, thank you very much. Oh yes, yeah, good fish, very good fish. My, we got one of the big resonant browns here. That is unusual. Very big brown trout this is. This is a big old brownie with a paddle for a tail. This is one of the residential fish of Langford. Really dark. Langford's residential brown trout. Lovely, deep golden colour. Beautifully marked. Absolutely beautifully marked. Using his tail like a paddle here. Not the sort of fish you want to hurry. Doesn't like the look of the net, either. Fish. You can see the kipe at the end of it. Marvellous condition. That really is a picture. He's keeping his nose down and boring away. So you can only lift him by putting side strain against his direction. I think, oops, I think he's about ready. Well, that is a superb fish. That really is a marvellous fish. A little lever variation. A super example there, the lateral line on the fish. Um, they don't actually have ears, as conventional animals do. But they hear through vibration in the water. And this lateral line here, running right down the flank of the fish, head to tail, is actually their main sensory organ. They feel vibration in the water, they feel sound through their lateral line. Looking back over the history of fishing in this country, we're fortunate to have such a wealth of quality lakes and rivers. When we look to the future, the prospects are not so good. There are increasing instances of pollution in our lakes and rivers. Water abstraction leaves nature unable to cope with the high phosphate and nitrate levels from intensive farming methods. And the unusually long, hot summers of recent years compound these problems. All this is headache enough for those responsible for safe keeping our fisheries. 
In addition to this, fishery managers are pressured by anglers who feel that they must catch their full limit bag to get value for money. There are complaints from the general public about litter and discarded nylon. The incentive to carry on as a fishery demands dedication. There are many more profitable uses for lakes and rivers. It's a depressing thought that fisheries, large and small, may be going out of business, due in part at least to the indifferent attitudes of anglers themselves. Some of these problems can be addressed. The National Rivers Authority appears at least to be supportive of the fishermen's needs. Bodies like the Anglers' Cooperative Association protect our waterways by taking legal action against polluters and deserve as much support as we can give them. Anglers are major users of waterways and there's much we can do on an individual level. Going green is a phrase much bandied about by media and manufacturers alike, but it is worth remembering that some pollution comes directly from the detergents, bleaches and other household products that are used every day in every home. There are products available which limit the damage and anglers should be the first to use them. Well, it just shows you can never get everything right. Um, I've got this one very wrong. The fish are obviously moving up in the water now. Lots of surface activity, so the intermediate line is much too deep. So I'm going to change to the pleasure of the dry fly. Right. Spare rod always to hand. My friend Martin Cancross, who fishes here far more than I do, always tells me I read Steeple Langford wrong anyway, so I'll do the right thing now. So that's fishing. I hope you've enjoyed the video. I hope you've learned something from it. I certainly feel I'm learning all the time. That sounds a bit pious and very easy to say, but you learn every day by the water. You find some little secret of fly life or some new aspect of presentation, some aspect of fly selection, maybe just a little bit of gut feeling that changes with the conditions. But that really is what fishing is all about. A light approach, a thinking approach. Most of all, and more important than anything else, get some pleasure from what you do. Don't be preoccupied, don't be concerned with limit bags. Go out and enjoy the fishing, and it's been a success before you get a fish on the end. I wish you tight lines and many years of success.